Good morning. It's good to see you. I know we're a few minutes before 10. We're going to start the habit of trying to start the announcements a few minutes before 10, and at 10 we'll be in our worship service. We, uh, we want to start that. So if you want to hear the announcements, you need to be in here about 5 till. Otherwise, you'll see them on the screen, okay? We're so glad you're here with us this morning. If you're visiting, we'd like to have a record of your visit. Take a moment, fill out the yellow slip of paper with your name and address. And on the back is a place for a prayer request. If you're a member, you know somebody going in the hospital, or uh, you have a special prayer request you'd like to share with the family of God, put it on the yellow slip of paper. There's an insert in your bulletin about sharing God's Word. Be sure and take a look at that. A lot of things happening. Two weeks from today is Easter Sunday morning. Two, but a week from today, next Sunday night, the choir will be, be presenting the Easter musical, Come Walk With Me, on Palm Sunday night. Excuse me, not Easter Sunday night, Palm Sunday night. Come Walk With Me. Then on, East, on Thursday night of the Easter week, we will have the Monday Thursday service and no Wednesday night service. That's a, when we celebrate the Lord's Supper at the time Christ would have celebrated the Lord's Supper on Thursday evening. And then on Sunday morning at 6.30, we're going to have a sunrise service. We'll have some coffee, donuts, orange juice, so uh, they will be available out. We'll have it out in the front of the church. We have it each year at 6.30. Glorious time to remember the resurrection of our Lord. And then Easter Sunday morning service on Sunday morning at 10 o'clock. And then our normal uh, services for the rest of the day are canceled because of uh, Easter Sunday. We allow you to spend with your family and close friends. There's a number of other announcements, the spring game, training game, Easter dinner uh, for the solos, solos barbecue, dessert potluck is going to be on Easter, on Palm Sunday night following the Easter cantata, bring a dessert that will feed several people. Just a whole lot of things going on. We like to get together and eat, don't we? Speaking of eating, we do need a few more people to help bring cookies for in the morning, and we also need people who will help serve the cookies. And if you brought cookies, some of you need to go back and get your trays. You're leaving them. So take the tray home, fill it up, and bring it back. That's the way it works, okay? We're so glad you're here this morning. It's 10 o'clock. We want to worship. Yeah. 
please pray with me. Father God, we bow in your presence today. Thank you for the Lord Jesus. Thank you, Father, that because of Jesus, the victories are already won. And Lord, we know that we're in battle. We know, God, that we face the strong enemy. But God, we thank you that in the power and the blood of Jesus Christ, we're already victorious. So Lord, we just want to tell you we love you. We want to tell you, Lord, that we know how much we need you. And Lord, we thank you that you're our Savior. We thank you that you're our God. We thank you, Lord, that you promise us victory if we'll walk with you every day. Dear God, there are those in our midst today who are struggling, some who have suffered loss. Dear God, I pray that you'll be with those families and those people that have suffered the loss of someone they love so dearly. Dear God, we thank you that you know how to deal with that. There are many in our church, Lord, either they are ill or some of their family are ill. Lord, we lift them to you today. Thank you, God, that you're the great healer. You're the great physician. And Lord, I praise you that you're going to heal and you're going to have your way in the powerful name of Jesus Christ. God, now guide all that we do today. May we honor you. May we lift up the powerful and mighty name of Jesus Christ. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. Amen. While you're being seated, I want to say I have had the privilege through the years of pastoring a lot of men who were a part of one of the greatest organizations in the world that I am not allowed to be a member of. Did you know that a pastor cannot be a Gideon? That's right. Pastors cannot be a Gideon. It's made up of godly businessmen who love the Lord. And Ron Gale, one of several men in our congregation who are Gideons, is going to come and share with us a little about the work of Gideons. Thank you, Pastor. Six months ago, September the 17th of 15, just six months ago, we gave out our second billionth Bible. Couldn't have done that without help from churches like Grand Community Baptist Church. We thank you. I want to get read a couple of testimonies because they're link- one of them is lengthy, but I just want to, don't want to leave out a word. Six days and six nights with God. My name is Mike Nicholas. I grew up in a broken home and was forced to live with many people. My grandparents, uncle, aunt, church members, whoever else would take me in. I married my wife, Stacy, at the age of 17. My problems with drugs and alcohol kept us far away from the church. We had three daughters who I also kept from church except for rare occasions. Alcohol consumed me. I worked very hard, but I drank from the time I got off work until bedtime. I never physically hurt my wife or daughters, but I was verbally abusive to all of them. I did a lot of damage over 23 years of marriage. Then in October 2012, my wife kicked me out of the house. She was hurt as well as my children. I had ripped my family apart. Alone in a motel room, I opened a drawer in a nightstand. I saw a Bible, opened it, and started reading. I stayed in that room six days and six nights, all day and all night. I asked God to forgive me, come into my heart, save me from my alcohol addiction, take it completely out of my mind. I cried and begged, Lord, Jesus, please do not let me lose my family. If you do this for me, I will serve you for the rest of my life. I haven't had a drink since October the 17th of 2012. That's with no outside help, but just God and me. John 14, 14 says, if you ask anything in my name, I will do it. God said it and I believed it. After this miracle, I returned to my home in White House, Tennessee, with forgiveness from my family I told them I was a changed man. I was going to live my life for Jesus. We started attending church the last week of December 2012. Now all three of my daughters have received Jesus as their Lord and Savior. All three are baptized and living the Word of God. Praise Jesus. I have another one called a monster by his own mother. Death Row inmate Robert Simon Jr. waited out the days of his punishment with bad attitude and a rough behavior. His spot on death row was earned by his many crimes, 
which, for which he received two life terms and a death sentence. A Gideon camp in Mississippi was allowed the privilege and responsibility of taking God's word to the penitentiary in September 2012. When the Gideons approached death row, the guards warned against speaking to Simon due to his outburst of anger and violence. However, with the help of prayer and courage to do the work, Brother Ray Williams was allowed a conversation with Simon. Simon's initial response was, stay away. I'm too bad to be saved. That was, I'm too far gone and too mean. Brother Williams proceeded to share the love of God and laid out a simple plan of salvation, a free gift offered to all who would accept it. As he began to actually feel the love that he was being told of, showing in the kindness of the Gideon, something seemed to suddenly resonate with Simon. In response, Simon bowed to his knees, received Christ Jesus as his Lord and Savior, much to the astonishment of the officers present. They said, praise God for his grace and mercy and for establishing the ministry of the Gideons. We were taught to train and equip men and women to lead others to Christ. I just want to share a couple of things with you. That's why we give out God's word. And like I say, we cannot do that without your help. We're going to take an offering to close of the service. Next week, we could use your prayers. <coughs> After next week, which is a spring break for schools, we're going to uh, attend, I think it's four schools, high schools and mid schools, and give out <coughs> testaments. We need your prayers as students will take these scriptures, take them home and read them. As we've learned, only about three or four percent of children are now taught the Bible through churches. Only about three or four percent go. Also, we need prayer for our Gideons throughout the world. We have 21 Muslim countries in which we have Gideons organized in. They need our prayers, certainly do. Uh, we need more men and women to serve in this great uh, ministry. We have a card ministry. We get about 30% of our funds from churches, about 33% from our card ministry, which is out in the foyer. We want you to take those cards. Those cards are free. If you put a dollar or five dollars or ten dollars in them great that helps buy more Bible but we want you to use those we have memorial cards memory cards uh, thinking of you and and, uh, and appreciation send one to your Sunday school teacher or your pastor or to a neighbor if you came unprepared to give today take out the insert please do not take that home and discard it read it there's a testimony in there also there's a tear off envelope you can if you came unprepared to give today Take that envelope and place a check in it tomorrow and mail it in. Uh, every penny, as I often told you, goes to buy Bibles. Not a penny is deducted. Uh, April 1st of this year, we're going to have our international convention. I want our pastor to attend that. We have a pastor's banquet, and we'll have Gideons from all over the world come in. So we want to be a part of that. Uh, it's just a great time to meet other Gideons and hear their testimonies. Thank you for what you're going to give. Amen. Thank you, Ron. What a better way to, to put on the gospel armor than to hand somebody a Bible. Tell them about Christ. Lead on, O King Eternal. With deeds of love and mercy, I 
Our reading today is found in Ephesians chapter 6, verses 13 through 17. I'll be reading from my Schofield King James. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that he may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Stand therefore, having your loins girded about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Let us pray. Father God, as we come before you humbly, dear Father, prepared to give of our tithes and offerings, we just pray that you'll bless each <laughs> gift, each giver, and be multiplied to bring honor and glory to your name. We thank you, dear Father, for each day that uh, we have an opportunity to be here. We thank you for the congregation. We pray a blessing upon everyone here. And I pray for the ones not here, dear Father, especially the shut-ins, that you, they'll not feel alone, that they'll feel that you're with them. And Father, we just thank you for all the many blessings you've given them to us. And what an opportunity we have now of what you have given to us to give back to you. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Gay. Jesus paid it all. In a world 
circle of broken dreams Where the truth is hard to find For every promise that is kept There are many left behind Though it seems that nobody It still matters what you do Cause there's a difference you can make But the choice is up to you Will you be the one to answer to his call? Will you stand when the Tell me you will be the one Oh, sometimes it's hard to know Who is right and what is When the battle lines are drawn There's a voice that keeps calling out For someone who's not afraid To be a beacon in the night To a world that's lost its way provides the power for me to stand and say yes, I will be the one to answer to this call. I will stand with those around me fall. I will be the one to take his life into a dark Are y'all awake? We got to do better than that. Let's try it again. We're at war. There we go. Okay, praise God. Take your Bible and have it open uh, to Ephesians chapter 6. We come today to the second part of our message entitled Preparation for the Battle. Now, last time when we were together, uh, we learned three things about how to get ready to go to war. The first thing is we need to solidify our relationship uh, with Jesus Christ. We need to make certain that, that we have been saved. Uh, so we need to solidify that relationship with the Lord. And then we need to make certain that in our life that we are growing in our relationship with Jesus Christ. Okay? 
Listen, if you don't have those things settled in your life, that is where Satan is going to attack you. So we need to be uh, ready for that. We need to be doing, uh, uh, the Apostle Paul said this, uh, in, in all those things that you do, stand strong or get strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Folks, we need to learn to do that. And then second of all, not only do we need to solidify our relationship with God, but we need to learn to function in God's strength. Now, I want you to get this. If you try to go to battle against Satan and you do it in your own strength and in your own power, you will lose. And you will lose every single time. You are not in your own strength and power, more powerful than Satan. He is stronger than you are. He is able to beat you on your own. But my friends, the Bible says, greater is he who is in me than he that is in the world. And when we allow the Lord Jesus Christ to fill us, and we function not in our strength, but in his strength, we will win every single time. Do you believe that's true? That's true. We will win every single time. So we need to <coughs> not only solidify our walk with God, but we need to stand in God's strength. We need to learn to function in the strength of God. And then last time we learned the importance of suiting up. And that means we need to know why it's important to put on the armor of God. And we need to do that for two reasons. Number one, so that we can resist the, the devil and his attacks. Uh, Paul says, uh, put on the armor of God so that you may be able to resist in the evil day. And my friends, if you don't think these days are evil, wake up. They're evil, aren't they? Th this is an evil world. This is a wicked world. By the way, this is an evil nation right now. Listen, our nation doesn't love Jesus. It hates Jesus. It doesn't love the things of God. It hates the things of God. This is not a godly nation. This is an ungodly nation. And that's the nation that we live in. Okay? So we need to be able to stand strong in the evil day, to resist in the evil day. By the way, the scripture says resist Satan and he will do what? He will flee from you. He'll run from you, my friends, when we stand against him. And then he says, and to do all of those things, stand firm. In other words, plant yourself and, and, and be planted so that you can go to battle. Now, that's where we stopped last time. So now we come to number four. Number four, and we're going to spend the rest of our time today looking at number four. And so the, the, the fourth step is this, suit up. All right? Suit up. You need to put on the armor of God. Now, Paul says it this way. Go back to verse 13. Uh, Ron read this a moment ago. Verse 13, therefore, take up the whole armor of God so that you'll be able to, re to resist in the evil day and having done everything to stand firm. Stand firm, therefore, having girded your loins with truth. Now, we're going to come and talk about how to put on the armor of God and what that armor of God is. So number one, or A in your outline, the armor of God is made up of five five things. And you're going to say to me when we get to it there in a little bit, Pastor, you left out one. I want to go ahead and tell you right now, the last one is not armor, it's the weapon. Hello? A sword is not armor, it's the weapon. Okay? We'll come to that when we get back after Easter to this topic again. Okay? But now today, we're going to talk about putting on the armor of God. So number one, you need to put on uh, truth. You need to put on truth. Paul says, therefore, uh, stand firm, having girded your loins with truth. Now, I want to talk about what it means to gird your loins. Uh, all right? Now, now, I want you to think about for a moment how the folks dressed in the days of Paul. How, how many of you think they dressed like we did? When they got ready to go to church, the fellas put on a suit and tie like us, right? No? What, what did everybody put on? Men and women, what did they put on? Uh, it was called a tunic, all right? Uh, fellas, just so you get this, they wore dresses back in the day. All right? They were long. Most of them, they were long, hung down to the floor. Now, if you've ever seen a soldier, sometimes they show those soldiers and they've got a little mini skirt looking thing on. 
Most of the time, that's not very accurate, okay? What they really wore most of the time was a tunic. And a tunic was simply a piece of cloth with a hole cut for your head. And, and you put your head over the top of your head and it hung down in the front, hung down in the back. And then they had something that went right around here. Now, fellas, you know, we wear one of these, right? What is this? A belt. Now, I wear a belt because my pants will fall off if I don't. All right, hello, let's just be honest about it. Now, these pants would not fall off. They're a little snug. But um, I've gained a few pounds, praise God. And, and uh, I, I'm, I'm, well, I've just a, got a whole lot of fat going on there. But anyway, that's another topic totally. And, uh, but in the day, they had what they called a girdle. Now, guys and ladies, a girdle is not what you're thinking of now that kind of smashes you in and whatever all that is. Um, that's not what a girdle was. Back then, a girdle was just a belt, okay? And they put it around, and it held all of that in place, okay? And so Paul is talking about that girdle, the girdle. And then he says you need to gird up your loins. Now, I'm going to try to explain this to you just simply as I can. To gird up your loins, this is what the guys did. Are y'all paying attention? Okay, can y'all see? Can everybody see? Here's what they did, okay? I'm sorry, Vicki. Excuse me. Here's what they did, okay? They did this, and then they kind of caught a hold of the front part of that dress and got it up out of the way, and then they reached underneath there and got the back part of that dress. Are you paying attention? Okay, and then they got a hold of that, and they pulled it up here. And they tucked it in here. And they made shorts. You think I'm kidding. Do you know what the loin is on your body? It's this part from here to here. The loin you girded up your loins. So you caught that material that if you tried to fight and all that material was hanging down there, what would happen? You'd trip, you'd fall, you'd, you, it, it, it'd get you in trouble. Or your enemy would catch a hold of that loose stuff and trip you up and drag you down and beat you up and kill you, right? So they would take that and make shorts. They would pull it in. That was called girding your loins. And, and so they would do that. And that would get them ready then to go to battle because it was out of the way. And then they would hang their weapons on the girdle, on the belt. Cool, huh? All right. Now, Paul says that when we get ready to go to battle, we need to put on the thing that's going to hold everything in place and keep us from getting tripped up. What is it that we put on? Well, Paul says it's truth. Truthfulness. How many of you have noticed in this election cycle? I must tell you, elections drive me insane. And I've figured out that when a polit, you want to know how to tell when a politician to tell is telling the truth, when his lips are not moving. <laughs> now, church, listen, listen. Do you know what's happened? We have just come to the place in America that, for a lot of people, telling the truth is not as major of an issue as it used to be. And even as believers, if we're not careful, Satan will push us to not always tell the truth. Now, I, may, may I suggest this to you? Stretching the truth takes truth and makes it a lie. <laughs> when I was a kid, I heard a guy say, man, we're going to tell a little white lie. I want to know what the difference between a white lie and a black lie is. There's still a lie. A half-truth is not half-truth. It's a lie. You know, when we go to court, we're supposed to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. My friends, you want to get ready to do battle with Satan. We need to build into our life that we're going to be truthful people, that we're going to tell the truth, that we're going to remove deceit from who we are. Let's be honest, we all have a tendency to do that. 
And, and we, need to, we need to get to the place where we're going to say, listen, I'm going to be a truthful person. I'm going to let truth be a part of who I am, what I am, and how I am. And I'm going to be a truthful person. Now listen, that's a grace of God. You and I won't do that alone. We need the Holy Spirit and God's help to build it into our lives. So we need to come to the Lord. And as we're armoring up, we need to say to God, God, today, let's let this be a truthful day. No deceit today, Lord. Help me to be a man of truth. When I speak something, let it be the truth. When I say something, let it be my word. I look for the day when, when at least as far as God's people are concerned, when we say something we mean it. When we say it, it's the truth. And when we say it, we stand by it. Amen. And and, and so Paul says, the way you get all the junk out of the way so you don't get tripped up is truth. We we build truth into our lives. and, And friends, we will lose in battle because we'll get tripped up if we do not put on truth, truthfulness. By the way, We build that into our lives by standing on the only truth we know, which is the truth of the Word of God. So number one, he says, put on truth. Then number two, put on righteousness. Put on righteousness. Paul then goes on to say, um, verse 14, Stand firm, therefore, having girded your loins with truth, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness. Now the breastplate, it was made of metal. Many times they made it to... have. Have y'all ever seen those Superman costumes? And on the costume, they build it so that you have a (laughs) six-pack. Amen. I need one of those because that's the only way I'm ever going to have a (laughs) six-pack. I must tell you, in my day, I was a flat belly. Do you know what a flat belly is? Lee Trevino said the young guys are flat bellies. The old guys are round bellies. Amen. I'm a, I'm a round belly. I'm not a flat belly. I used to be a flat belly. I had a flat belly at one time. I don't have that anymore. But they would actually, in that metal, they would shape it so that they looked all muscular and cool. Okay? But that wasn't the, you know, looking muscular is not the big deal. It, it's protecting. That, that thing wasn't to make you look fine. It was to make you be protected. Okay? And the part of the body they wanted to protect was from here to hear, right? And why did they want to protect that? Because of the heart, the lungs, the kidneys, the liver, the pancreas. If you harm those parts of your body, what happens? Most of the time you die. And if you don't die, you're not able to fight because you're wounded bad, okay? And then if you can't fight, then you die, right? Okay, so they would wear the breastplate to protect the vital organs. Sometimes it was only the front. Sometimes it covered front and back. Okay, but they put on the breastplate. Now, the breastplate for us is righteousness. Now, the word righteous does not mean what we get when we trust Christ as Savior. He makes us righteous, right, with God. But now this is talking about living a life of moral rectitude, of uh, of moral uprightness. In other words, we choose that we're going to live our life according to God's terms. Now, my friends, I've got to say this. None of us are going to do this perfectly. We're going to fail from time to time. And when we fail immediately, as soon as we recognize we have sinned, we need to come to God. We need to beg God to forgive us. And according to 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sin, God will do what? He will forgive our sins and he will cleanse us of all unrighteousness. We need to learn to deal with the sin in our lives. But then we need to choose to try to live every day as best as we can in the power of the Holy Spirit in a righteous way, living life on God's terms. Now, you know how Satan's going to battle you? Satan is going to battle you by saying to you, you don't have to live God's way. Does he ever whisper that in your ear? He does in my ear all the time. You know, you don't have to do it that way. That's not, you know, that's not a big deal. Listen, my friends, it is a big deal. Paul says... The thing that protects the vital organs, the thing of who we are, the life that we are, is righteousness. So Paul says, gird your loins with truth, protect your vital organs with righteousness. And then he says, in verse 15, having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. 
Now, I was trying to figure out how to explain this to you. They, they wore shoes. They most of the time wore sandals. And so they had some covering over the top of the foot. Uh, but to them, that was not as vital uh, as other things. The bottom of that sole was very thick leather, very tough, very solid. And it gave them a good foundation. But you know what I found out about military shoes in that day? They had hobnails in them. Does somebody know what hobnails are? They would drive nails through the bottoms of those shoes so that the nails stuck out on the bottom. So you know what military shoes were in our terminology today? Cleats. Golf shoes. Who said golf shoes? Amen. That's right. Golf shoes. I have golf shoes. I like my golf shoes. Now, the very first pair of golf shoes that I had, in fact, the very first several pairs of golf shoes that I had, used to have what? Metal spikes. They called them metal spikes. And when you first got them, they were about three quarters of an inch long. After you had them for a while, they were about a quarter of an inch long right? And then you would take them out and put in new ones. And the reason for those on the bottoms of your golf shoes is because traction. Who said that? That's right, Alice from Dallas. Traction. <laughs> Praise God. And, and, and you know what I found out? Now, when I was younger, I could swing a golf club pretty hard. I was limber, and I could swing that club way back around like old John Daly does. Bubba, you know, and then, and, and I found out that when you did that, sometimes your feet would go, now, you know what? I get happy feet, and it don't matter if I have cleats on or not. Sometimes I go to swing my golf club, and you can ask Ed or any of the guys that have been there with me. They, they've watched the pastor do dancing instead of swinging a golf club. I tend to want to dance around a little bit because I like to watch. And so, you know, I get to move, and woo -hoo! And And you know what I found out? If you're moving around, you don't hit the ball very good. <laughs> but if you can get your feet planted, you know, and get them to go, you can swing and hit that ball pretty good. You know what I found out? It's important that you have traction. Guess what? In battle, if you didn't have traction, what would happen? They'd knock you down. They'd poke you with their sword. They'd kill you dead. Right? That's not a good thing. You had to have traction. And so the, the shoes, having shod your feet, the shoes were to give you traction so you could stand in the battle. Now, what is the... What is the thing that we put on? Well, we put on the gospel. Paul says, having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. I got to thinking about what is that gospel of peace? The gospel is the good news of Jesus Christ. And when you and I invite Jesus Christ into our heart as sinners, he brings peace into our life because our sin is forgiven and, and we've been made a new person in Jesus Christ. That's incredible. Now, now, what does it mean, the preparation of that gospel? Well, I, I want to say to you again, and, and you're going to hear me say this one more time in just a moment, but you need to be certain for you that you're saved. You need to be certain that you've asked Jesus Christ into your heart. And you say, Pastor, you're harping on that a lot. Well, you know why? Because that's the area that Satan is going to pound you the most. And until you lock it down, until you're certain, until you're dead set in that you have been saved, that you've been born again, that you're a child of the king, he will attack you in that area. But then it means that we are prepared then to share that with somebody else. It means that we're ready to then share that gospel with somebody else. You say, Pastor, you talk a lot about sharing the gospel. You know why I do? Because the Bible talks a lot about it. And the Apostle Paul says we can't get away from that. Listen, you and I need to be ready to share our faith in Jesus Christ. And one of the ways that Satan will defeat us is if we're not prepared, if we're not ready to share the gospel with other people. We need to know how to do that. And so you and I have to make a conscious effort to learn how to share the gospel in simplicity and, and how to share it with somebody else that does not know the Savior. He says that we stand firm by being 
certain that we're saved by being certain of our relationship with God, but then by being certain that we know how to talk to others about Jesus Christ. Now, I'm going to ask you, does that mean you're going to have all the answers? Here's the answer. No, you're not. It does not mean you have to know all the answers. It means that you know the basic truths and that you're willing to share those with somebody who doesn't know the Savior. We put on the gospel. And then number four, D, D in your outline. We need to put on faith. We need to put on faith. Now, Paul comes to say this. In addition to all, taking up the shield of faith with which you are able to extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Now, I got to go see the other day the movie. What was the name of that movie? Risen. Risen. Thank you. Praise God. I got to go see that the other day. And in that movie, the head guy, the prefect, that the, is the main character of the movie, he is a soldier. Guess what he has? He has a sword. That's his weapon. But he also had a shield. And he had a shield that was one of those little shields, you know, about as big as a trash can lid. Did y'all ever do that when you were a kid? You know, you'd have a sword, it was some kind of stick, and, the, and your shield was the metal trash can lid off your trash can at your house. I got in more trouble messing up trash can lids at my house. Amen. You know, boys, we couldn't just do that. We'd smack them lids and we'd bend them, and then they wouldn't fit on the trash can right. And then guess who'd get yelled at because he bent the trash can lid? Amen. That's not what this is talking about. This is talking about a full body shield. A full body shield was anywhere from four and a half to five and a half feet tall. It was made of very thick pieces of wood and it was a soft wood. And they would take and, and, and sometimes even have a little tiny gap in the, in the place to look through and they would actually be down behind that thing. Now, do you know why they used that great big gigantic, I mean, it was sometimes, you know, two and a half feet wide and four and a half, five, five and a half feet tall. And they would have that shield and they could put their arms in there, get a hold of that thing. And, they, and do you know why they, they used that great big shield? Pardon? To protect them, yeah. And they, you know what would happen? The enemy would shoot arrows at them and in fact would throw spears at them, all kind of stuff. And, and, and they would try to harm them and... Paul goes on to say here in a second that they even would shoot burning arrows at them, okay? And so they would hide behind that and it would protect them from the attack. Now, what is it that protects us? Well, Paul says it's faith. Now, in Hebrews chapter 11, verses 1 and 2, uh, the writer of Hebrews says, Now, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things by it not seen. For by it, the men of old gained approval. Now, listen, you, I'm going to put it just as simple as I can. Do you know what faith is? Faith is utter and total dependence on God. That's what faith is. Faith is utterly, totally depending upon God. I can't do it. God, I trust you. Now, do you know what happens when you and I take up faith? When we stand by faith, when we put our trust in God and in God alone, we put God between us and the enemy. That's what Paul says. Paul says God is our shield. He becomes the one that is between us and the enemy. And so Paul says, when the, when the enemy fires a arrows at you and they're lit on fire, they would take and stick those arrows in pitch, tar, and they would set it on fire. And then they would shoot those arrows. And so the arrow, the point of the arrow would pierce you and it would mess you up. But then the flames would burn you and would burn the other things. But that's where the shield came in. You remember I said that the shield was made of wood and it was kind of a soft wood? What would happen is they would shoot the fiery arrow. The fiery arrow would hit that soft wood. Do you know what would happen? It would sink into the wood and put the fire out. And you didn't get hurt. Paul says Satan has fiery arrows. He'll shoot those fiery arrows at us. But when we have God between us and the enemy, it just hits that shield and is put out. Wow. What is that? Faith. 
totally depending upon God. We need to choose that we're going to trust God every day. Amen? And then finally, last thing, last thing. I'm hurrying. We need to put on salvation. Verse 17. And say, it says, and take the helmet of salvation. The helmet protected the head. What was the one other vital organ that needed protecting? The brain. <laughs> okay. If you hit the brain, guess what else happens? You die. Right? And so they would wear the helmet to protect the head. What is it that protects our head? Salvation. Paul says not one time but twice when it comes to putting on armor, make sure about salvation. He says put on the preparation of the gospel of peace with our feet, with our head. Do you get it? The top, the bottom is what? Salvation. What do we stand on? Salvation. What do we put on to protect our head? Salvation. We, we need to be sure we're saved. I, I got to thinking, why do we need to be settled about salvation? We need to be settled about salvation because we, when we're saved, our sins are forgiven. When we're saved, our sins are forgiven. When we're saved, God has made us a new creation and he is changing us every single day and making us life Christ. When we're saved... It's, uh, we can approach the throne of grace with boldness. In the book of Hebrews, it says, because of who you are in Jesus Christ, you can approach his throne of grace with boldness. And then it says, when we're saved, we must remember that we're children of God and that as children of God, God has promised never to leave us or forsake us. We must remember that when we're saved, that the battle is already won and that we will be victorious in the end. And then we need to remember that when we're saved, that you and I will someday be with him in glory because of our salvation and that nothing Nothing the enemy can do to us is ever uh, anything that would compare to what will happen when we get to be with God someday in glory. Amen? <sighs> we need to armor up, y'all. Okay? That's how you get ready to fight. Okay? You, you, got, you got to put on the armor. You have to get ready to fight. Now listen. Sometimes we not only need to do it once a day, but we need to do it multiple times a day. Right? We need to do it multiple times a day. Put on the armor of God. Look on the screen. Truth, righteousness, the gospel, faith, salvation. We need to put on the armor of God, my friends. When you and I armor up, we will resist. When you and I armor up, we will stand firm. When you and I armor up, we will win. Pray with me. Father God, thank you. Thank you for the glorious message of Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord, for the glorious message that in Christ we win. And thank you, God, that you give us the armor that lets us be ready to go to battle. Thank you, God, that you help us to be ready. Lord, right now, in this time of invitation, I pray that you'll move by your power. God, please, if there's someone that needs to join this church, especially God today, if there's someone that needs to give their heart to Jesus as Savior and Lord, Father, I pray that they'll come right now. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray, amen. If you're here and you've never trusted Christ, my friend, please give your life to Jesus today. We'd love to help you make that commitment. If you're here and you need to become a part of Grand Community Baptist Church, God has told you, join this church. You need to come and get that settled today. As we stand together, as we sing, if you ought to come right now, right now, you step out, you come. <coughs>
Please be seated for just a moment. Uh, I, well, <laughs> ah, praise God. Um, we, had a, we had a phone call this week at the office, and Richard Haynes uh, said he wanted to set up an appointment to come visit with me about joining the church. And uh, one of the things that I shared with Richard as we visited, and my, how we're blessed. We are so blessed. And, uh, and I said, Richard, if you want to get with Rick ahead of time, and um, he can help you fill out the um, uh, paperwork on that, and, and then you can become a part of our church. And so I got a text from Phyllis and Rick, and they said, Richard's been over to the house. We filled out the paperwork. He's walking the aisle Sunday. Listen, I need you to know, I preach better if I know folks are coming. That's pretty awesome. Pretty, pretty cool. Amen. Richard, come up here and stand by me. Richard trusted Christ many, many years ago, was scripturally baptized in a Baptist church, but it's been many years ago. So he is coming today on the statement of the fact that he knows Jesus as his Savior, has been scripturally baptized, and wants to be a part of the family here at Grand Community Baptist Church. If you're thrilled about that, raise your hand and say amen, will you? Amen. Amen. That is so awesome. John, come up here and stand by me. You guys know John Wright. John, um, I, I have had the privilege of knowing John now and getting acquainted with him ever since I first came as your pastor. John today is coming to be a part of the family of faith. He trusted Christ as his Savior some time back, and he is coming today uh, by baptism. John has never been immersed in water. Uh, we know how to fix that. Right? Amen? We know how to fix that. And so we're going to set up a time real soon uh, to do baptism for John. Uh, I've got to tell you that nothing in the world excites me as much as seeing people who come and say, I want to be baptized, Pastor. I want to follow the Lord and do what God says. Amen? Amen. Praise God. Praise God. It is such a joy that John and, and Richard are here today. Now, before you leave... Okay, before you leave, please come and greet these fellas. Please tell them your name. Now, they already have name badges, so that will help. But remember that we've got to learn each other's names, so remember to wear your name badge, and that'll be a really great thing. Okay, please come and greet these fellas before we leave. What, a, what an incredible day. Please be back this evening. Uh, make your plans for all the stuff that's going on. Uh, 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 and so it's just going to be, uh, it, it's just so awesome. I can't stand it. It is just so good. <laughs> Praise God. All right. Let's, pardon me, Billy Graham. Oh, my gracious. Friday, Friday at noon at the House of Representatives building uh, downtown. There's going to be a prayer rally with Franklin Graham. I'm going, okay? If you want to come go, we're going to meet at the church at 10 o'clock. Now, you say, Pastor, why at 10 o'clock? Because it's going to take us about an hour to get down there, find a place to park, and then we may have to hike a little bit, okay? I'm going to suggest to you that you bring several things. You bring sunscreen because it's outside, that you bring water because it's outside, and that you bring a chair because they probably don't have chairs, Okay, so I'm going to bring my chairs that I take with me. 
I don't go camping much, but whenever I go someplace that doesn't have a chair, I got me a chair I can carry. And I'm going to bring my two or three in case somebody doesn't have one. If you want to meet with us, we will gather at 10. We will leave out of here at 1015. Some of you might fill your car up with gas because we may have to carpool down there. Okay, but if you'd like to go with me, I will be here at 10 o'clock. I will leave about 1015. You can come go with me. Please join us. It's going to be a neat time. We'll go pray. Yes, Russ. Oh, wow. So if you can't go, you can put it on your computer. Go to, I think it's Billy Graham Evangelistic Association, and you can find it there. Watch it as it streams live. Uh, that will be cool. Uh, if you don't do any of that at noon on Friday, wherever you are, stop and pray. Pray for our nation. Pray for Arizona. Pray for our leaders. Pray that God would start a revival, and pray that God would let it start right here at Grand Community Baptist Church. Amen? Amen. Let's see God do something powerful. Thank you, Pam. Love you, babe. Okay, all right. Who's praying? Roger. Roger. Amen. Stutzman. In the choir loft, Roger's going to lead us in prayer. Come by and greet our two newest folks and tell them how much you love them and how thrilled you are that they've come to be a part of the family here at Grand Community Baptist Church. Amen. Pray, Roger. Let us stand. <clears throat> Fathers, we come to you this morning. I thank you for this day that you set aside each week just to remember you, remember who you are and what you've done for us. Father, I thank you that we as Christians can come together and hear your word, hear the word about putting on the armor, your armor. And Father, I just pray that... Uh, all of us will take this to heart, that, that we will be a blessing to you, that we will uh, sing your praises. Father, that we will bring honor and glory to your name. And Father, I pray that your hand will be on each and every person here today. I pray you will protect them, be with them this week. And Father, we thank you for our pastor and the leadership that brings this word to us. And we thank you for your Holy Spirit that directs him. Father, now as we go, we ask your blessing upon us. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.